Welcome to Screenplay vs. Final Film. This is the show where we'll compare and discuss the differences between the screenplay draft and its final film. This will establish how most movies are changed from draft to draft all the way up to principal photography. The changes might be for better or for worse. You decide. The title we have today is 1976's mega-hit award-winning Rocky. Written by Sylvester Stallone, known for writing the Rocky series, the Rambo series, the Expendable series, and many, 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 many more. Cobra. The screenplay draft we have is from January 7th, 1976. All right, first things first, let's start with something minor, the date. November 12th versus November 25th. There could be a number of reasons why this day has changed, so who knows. In the opening scene, we have Rocky fighting Spider Rico, who's supposed to be a Puerto Rican fighter. Versus in the screenplay, Spider Rico's name is Spider Rice, and he's a black fighter. In the movie, we never get to see Spider Rico's corner, but in the script, the black fighter spits something right in a bucket and sneers across the ring at Rocky. And he's trying to hype himself up on what he thinks he's gonna do. Inside the dingy dressing room in the movie is just Rock and Spider, but in the screenplay, there's 10 other fighters. Some of them are chatting, and some of them are preparing for war in a smoky dressing room. And this is back when you could smoke anywhere. I think it was wise to cut out all the extra fighters in the dressing room. There's no need for it. It doesn't advance the story. The scene works just fine with Rocky and Spider. So Spider Rico is a character we see a couple of more times throughout the complete saga. He shows up in a few scenes in Rocky Balboa, and then there's a deleted scene in Creed 2 that shows Rocky at his funeral service. It's crazy to think that Spider Rico lasted longer than Mickey, Adrian, Polly, and Apollo. <laughs> Alright, moving on. So in the screenplay, Rocky gets $61. But in the final film, Rocky gets 40, 55. So in this next scene that's no mention in the movie, Rocky's in the trolley with the old thin black woman. She studies Rocky's face and he becomes self-conscious. He lets her know that he's a fighter, but the exhausted old hag thinks he might be special needs. When Rocky exits the trolley, he walks down the block. He waves at a pair of high heeled hookers and they wave back, which never happens in the film. I'm thinking these two short scenes were totally omitted from the script in the later draft. Outside the pet shop, Rocky waves at a small dog in the window, versus a huge dog sitting in the window. I'm pretty certain that his dog, Buckus, was supposed to be the huge dog sitting in the window, but maybe he couldn't fit in that small space. Inside Rocky's apartment in the screenplay, he turns on his record player. As the crackling music begins, Rocky picks up a hairbrush using it like a microphone. He mines to the record. He assumes the posture of a famous singer croning to thousands of his adoring fans. He then switches into a bullish fighting stance and throws several punches. It looks like that Rocky in the movie is this wannabe commercial actor, but in the script, he's more of a wannabe singer. Alright, enough of that, let's get back to it. Also, in the script in his apartment, Rocky boils a pan of water so he can soak his badly swollen hands that he used to pound Spider Rico's face. So it looks like Rocky opted out of the heat method and went with the ice method in the final film. Next up in the screenplay, Rocky goes to the docks, but in the final film, he actually goes to the pet store first. But I'll run through the differences in the dock scene first. So in both screenplay and movie, Rocky finds Bob. The screenplay also calls him Fats. In the film, Rocky chases him down on the tow motor, but in the script, the chase is a little more extended. So in the script, Bob is working on a crane and not driving a tow motor. Bob sees Rocky and takes off into the ship's hole, where Rocky gives chase and runs up the gangplank. Rocky eventually catches up with him inside the ship and flings him by his neck against the wall of stacked cargo. But the character Bob has a little more fight in the script by picking up a large metal hook used by stevedores. Rocky remains cool, but he's not happy. Bob drops the hook. Rocky suddenly grabs his stump and bends him to his knees as he begs for mercy. Rocky releases him and tells him that's what could have happened and walks off. Now we get to the pet shop scene in the screenplay. It's called Animal Town Pet Shop, but in the movie, the sign clearly says J&M Tropical Fish. In the screenplay, Rocky sees Adrian behind the counter and presses his face up against the window and does an impression of the hunchback in Notre Dame. A big difference here is he kind of comes to Adrian's aid. When he walks in, Adrian is dealing with the dumb customer that puts her puppy inside of a bag. Adrian insists that she takes it out, but the lady's not having it. She says things like, I paid for this dog, I could do whatever I want with it, I could throw it through the window if I I want, and Rocky can't bear the disrespect. Rocky walks over to her, stares hard at her face, and snatches the bag out of her hand. He removes the puppy and hands it to Adrian. The mean old witch gets her change and takes off. That's a great way of showing your hero characters being decent human beings, caring about animal rights and animal abuse. In the script, outside of the gym, Rocky runs into Rudy, a young Irishman who runs a small pretzel stand. It is apparent from his face that he was a prize fighter. He is blind and mentally defective. So Rudy asks Rocky if he saw the Creed fight last night, and Rocky responds, nah, I was fighting last night. Rudy says Apollo Creed beat the bum to pieces. 
In the screenplay, when Rocky enters the gym, music by the Isley Brothers is blaring out. As he walks through the gym, many fighters pause, wave, and give greetings. A couple of fighters have small conversations with him as he moves through the gym, one being about the fight with Spider and another conversation about a stupid masturbation joke that doesn't hold up. Versus in the film, Rocky just walks across the gym minding his own business, with no one paying attention to him. As Rocky is making his way to Mickey, his assistant Mike tags along. Mike brings up the Apollo fight too. He says that Apollo Creed beat the English guy so bad. Rocky responds back with, Creed's great. Mike fakes a friendly punch at Rocky and hurries off to another chore. When Rocky approaches Mickey in the screenplay, he's speaking with another fighter about Apollo Creed. Mickey also brings up the fighter, Big Dipper, which is a subplot in the screenplay. As Rocky walks away, Mickey starts talking trash with Mike. Mickey says, known him since he was 15, a waste of life. That's interesting, Mickey has known him for that long. I never knew. Moving on. In the script, during the confrontation outside of the Atomic Hoagie Shop with the young teenagers and Marie, the chip-toothed character threatens to kill Rocky and tells him that he has a gun. Rocky's response is classic. Pull heat on me, I'll dent your face. I feel Rocky is tougher in the screenplay and doesn't take anybody's nonsense. During the walk when Rocky's escorting Marie home, standing in the shadows of the building are three young muggers. The light from their cigarettes flare red in their faces. The muggers follow them, but Rocky eventually sees them and stops and faces the three. Rocky gives a loud boxer snort, wipes his nose with the side of his thumb, and rolls his shoulder. The muggers are intimidated and slowly peel off. He's a tough guy. In this draft, Marie doesn't say, screw you, creepo, but she gets a little more vulgar. Hey, Rocky. Yo. F you, creepo. So later in the script, when Rocky's back at the gym, everybody takes notice of his presence in wonderment. The big black heavyweight contender, Dipper, throws the towel down in disgust and turns away. Mike approaches Rocky and asks what's happening, but Rocky has no clue what he's talking about. In the script, it seems like everybody knows that Apollo Creed's people want Rocky for something. Moments later, Mickey gives him the business card and Rocky takes off. Mickey fumbles with his rosary beads and calls Rocky a waste of life. So in the screenplay, there's no confrontation between Mickey and Rocky. You want to know? I want to know! Rocky splits and Mickey just talks trash. When Rocky meets the promoter, Miles Jurgens, we learn in the movie his name has been changed to... George Jurgens. In the screenplay, when Jurgens is asking Rocky about fighting Apollo, Rocky interrupts and thinks it's for sparring. After Rocky's ramblings, Jurgens asks if he will be interested in fighting Apollo Creed for the championship. And Rocky continues to ramble about sparring and training with Apollo. Jurgen repeats the question. Would you be interested in fighting Apollo Creed for the World Heavyweight Championship? And the weight of the statement comes crashing down on Rocky. He thinks about it and answers. Yes, absolutely, yes. In the final film, when Jurgens asks Rocky if he wants to fight Apollo, he says. No. Obviously, he accepts the match, but in the film, he turns it down out of fear. I think that shows better in his character and the struggle within himself than saying absolutely to fight Apollo. Rocky's not very confident right now. It wouldn't be such a good fight. But, but it's a huge opportunity, and like Mickey says later, What happened to you is freak luck. Originally, this scene was supposed to be at the Atomic Hoagie Shop, but they filmed it at Pat's King of Steaks, a place that's on my list if I ever make it out to Philly. Rocky is with Gazzo the Gangster, and Gazzo has a pretty awesome monologue that tells us a little more about Rocky's past. He talks about when they were kids, and Rocky beat up this Irish kid named Gullinger. Gazzo bought a suit and became a businessman, and Rocky put on the gloves. During the conversation, it kind of sounds like they might even have been brothers. In the dialogue, Gazzo says, I remember Mama almost cried, may she rest in peace, and our old man who said you had no brains. It sounds like he's saying their mom and their dad. Maybe they were brothers. Maybe in this draft they were brothers. If anybody knows, let me know. Rocky goes to see Polly at work and he's drunk. Kind of the same like in the final film, but this time they go into the shipping office. They see a couple of Polly's co-workers that are Puerto Rican. And I don't know if it's because I'm half Puerto Rican, but this script might have the most Puerto Ricans I've ever read. <laughs> Polly introduces Rocky as the guy who's fighting Apollo Creed, and one of the Puerto Ricans wishes him well. Polly tries to get them to cheer with a hip hip hooray, but it doesn't work too well. So next inside the freezer, everything pretty much happens the same. The only change is Rocky is going up and down the aisle punching at the meats. Rocky speeds up and continues pounding on the second row of beef. Rocky moves into the dark recesses of the refrigerator. Only the dull sounds of his pounding fist could be heard. Rocky works his way to Polly again. Every hanging beef swings and appears realistically alive. That would have been really cool to see Rocky going up and down the aisle punching at the meats. But at the end it was fine what they did and just had him concentrate on one piece of beef. Like it was a punching bag. I'll tell you what, the hitting the meat was iconic. Alright, moving forward. This next scene at Mickey's gym is very extended and it's known to be one of the lost scenes. And rumor has it is that the footage was incinerated in a studio fire. 
In the beginning of that scene, two young boys ask for Rocky's autograph versus two girls. The extended scene starts when Mike notices the reporters coming into the gym and set up their cameras. They start recording as the reporter starts his introduction. Of course, they're interested in Rocky. Rocky looks to Mickey and asks if he should do it. Mickey nods. The reporter is asking questions about his lifestyle, how he's preparing for the fight, if he has the chance, and he asks how he feels about Apollo putting him away in three. He honestly replies back that Apollo's a great fighter. Rocky, got anything derogatory to say about the champ? Derogatory? Yeah. He's great. <laughs> this is something they save for Rocky, too. Eventually, Apollo Creed and his entourage enter the gym. Apollo's bellowing, I am champion of the world! And Mickey's upset knowing that this is just a publicity stunt. Apollo walks up to Rocky talking 1970s trash. After this fight, he's gonna have to donate what's gonna be left of his body to science. But they also saved that one for Rocky, too. It was still the 70s. A dipper's in the background. He's in a ring getting vexed over the attention Rocky receives. Apollo announces that the fight will be on TV for free in just Philly. Creed starts to hype himself up and make a spectacle out of the whole thing. Everyone laughs. Dipper moves across the room like a large snake and steps behind Rocky and pushes him. Dipper starts making a scene and tries to start a fight, but Mickey's not having it. And Mickey explains that he doesn't want Rocky to take a chance on breaking his hand. He tells Dipper to hit the showers. Dipper disrespectfully talks back to Mickey and threatens to knock him out. The gym is silent. Apollo is apprehensive. The frightened television crew start packing away their gear, but Dipper wants the cameras to keep rolling and insists on Rocky to fight him. Dipper gives a deep cut and calls Mickey yellow. <laughs> Mickey starts explaining to everyone when Dipper suddenly slaps Rocky hard across his head and is enjoying every moment of it. Dipper continues talking out of his ass and tells Rocky to kiss his feet. Mickey knows it's about to get completely out of hand, but Rocky stands motionless. Mickey encourages Rocky to walk away and warns him that Dipper wants to hurt him so he can't fight. Rocky swallows his pride and still has a string around his ankles as he starts to shuffle away with Mickey. Dipper steps forward and viciously slaps Rocky again. Mike, Mickey's assistant, intervenes. However, Dipper cuts loose with a hook and knocks Mike flat out. The gym is silent. Apollo taps his bodyguards and they begin to ease away. Dipper tells Rocky to kiss his feet again while he eyes Mike laying on the floor. He shuffles forward and stands before Dipper. Dipper says, Kiss him. Rocky looks at Mickey, then lowers his eyes to Dipper's feet. Dipper smiles. Rocky starts to bend towards the shoes. Without warning, he explodes a pair of combinations into Dipper's exposed ribs. A crack is heard and Dipper sinks to the floor, writhing in pain. The room is silent except for Dipper's moaning. And Mickey's response is great. The kid got cannons. Print that. The crowd disperses, leaving Dipper a pathetic broken figure lying on the dirty gym floor. I would have loved to see this extended scene in the final film. One, it finishes the subplot and character arc of Big Dipper, which was the same guy who took his locker earlier. I dig your locker, man. And two, it foreshadows Rocky breaking Apollo's ribs in the fight. But also, it seems like Apollo is a little more aware and somewhat fearful of this unknown fighter he knows nothing about. And as the script says, he eyes Rocky with admiration and a hint of apparition, and it just reconfirms that Rocky hits hard. That would have been such an awesome scene to keep in there. Damn fire. Next is another lost scene that I wish they kept in. Adrian and Rocky enter their apartment and see about 10 telegrams on the floor. Rocky scoops them up and tosses them on a pile of over 100 telegrams. Adrian asks why doesn't he open them, and Rocky responds with some hateful remarks and comments written to him. Adrian pulls out short colorful curtains from a bag, and Rocky approves calling them and her sharp. She also pulls out a small Christmas wreath. They look so in love. But Rocky backs off of her, mentioning he can't fool around because it weakens the legs. She understands and takes off her sweater, revealing, nope, not that, that underneath is a t-shirt that reads, Win Rocky Win. Rocky likes it, and he wears it in Rocky too, but it makes him feel guilty. It's a very cute scene with the two. It would have made a very great addition to the movie. This lost scene was like a blend of this scene. There's no fooling around during training, you understand? I want to stay strong. And this scene. You walk down the street breaking hearts the way you're looking. Very shy. So next up. When Rocky and Buckus arrive at the meatpacking company in the film, there is just one news van versus the screenplay, where he notices several television news vans parked. In the screenplay, the dog never enters the freezer area, but there are several reporters and men with cameras milling around. It's kind of funny that I never noticed all the beef swinging behind him during this news report. I guess for that scene, he did go up and down the aisle punching at the beefs. In the script in this scene, they're in Mickey's clustered office above the gym, 
and both are watching 8mm movies of Apollo Creed in action. Rocky watches with intense concentration. Mickey speaks the truth on what he sees from Apollo's tapes and Rocky's style of what he needs to do. In the filmmaker's standpoint, they probably didn't do this scene because they would have had to create a whole nother fight for the footage of Rocky and Mick watching it. That would have definitely taken up time and money. Next, Mickey introduces Rocky to the new Cutman. In the screenplay, it's Benny Stein, but in the final film, it's... Al Savani. Take a look at his eyes. During the training montage in the screenplay, Rocky is running with a crowd of boys trailing him. He dashes through the streets and resembles the Pied Piper, which is another thing they did for Rocky too. Next up from the screenplay is a scene of Rocky meeting Mayor Rizzo. It's a scene we never see in the final film. Perhaps the scene was omitted in the later draft. Rocky walks into the office nervously as he approaches the mayor who is sitting behind a white desk. The mayor asks Rocky to sit and starts going through a thick file on his desk. He tells Rocky that he's been going through his records and that he's been a busy type, with 19 arrests, probation three times, expelled from seven schools in 64 and 65. Rocky's embarrassed and sinks into his chair. We learn a little more about Rocky's troubled history in this scene. The mayor explains to him in so many words, with great power comes great responsibility. Rocky says, I'll try. The mayor presses the button and a photographer enters taking three pictures of them shaking hands. The mayor thanks Rocky for coming by and asks, after the fight, you'll have nearly $150,000. What do you plan to do with it? Rocky smiles and says, run for mayor. The mayor is shocked at first, but then breaks into a big friendly laugh. That's good, the mayor knows how to take a joke. And now we're back in Adrian and Rocky's apartment. They are looking at different scrapbooks and magazines with mentions of Rocky. Adrian talks about how crazy it is that he's becoming famous. She flips through different magazines like Sports Illustrated, The American Sportsman, Ring Magazine, World Boxing, True, and a multitude of other clippings. Once again, a very cute scene with the two. Instead of going to the arena like he did in the final film, Rocky goes back to the gym to watch more fight tapes of Apollo. In the office, Rocky grabs a stack of 16mm films and loads them into the projector. Several hours later, Rocky is still at it with another Apollo Creed film as he sits emotionless. Something catches his eye. He sits upright and springs at the projector, rerunning the footage several times. Rocky stops the projector as Apollo is delivering a knockout blow. He moves closer to the projector and inspects it like a priceless painting. He backs off and begins to write on a notepad. I feel like both scenes with Rocky watching the fight tapes should have been kept in. Rocky knows boxing. He's very skilled at it. When I was a kid, I always thought of Rocky as this lucky, punchy boxer. But he couldn't have done what he did with Apollo if he wasn't skilled. And we see that throughout the whole progression of the series. For example, in Rocky 2, he learns how to fight predominantly with his right hand and gets a little more speed. In Rocky 3, he changes it up again and fights Apollo style. In part 4, he takes down a human mountain. And I guess part 5 happened. Go for it! But in Rocky Balboa, he came back and went the distance. And also, there's an alternate ending of him winning the fight. And in these days, he's been training the current champion, Adonis Creed. Rocco definitely has some skills. And overall, he's not this lucky boxer. But he's a skilled professional, as well as a legendary icon. Now at the arena, the script says that it's decorated with a ton of patriotic red, white, and blue. High above the ring are huge posters of George Washington, Abe Lincoln, Dr. Martin Luther King, Ben Franklin, and Apollo Creed. The arena is decorated in a ton of patriotic red, white, and blue. But there's no posters of George Washington, Abe Lincoln, Dr. Martin Luther King, Ben Franklin. But there is one of Apollo Creed, and there's another one of Rocky in the final film. On his way out to the ring in the hallway, we get a look at Rock's robe. In the final film, he's promoting Shamrock Meats, Inc., which is the company Paulie works for. But in the screenplay, he's repping Pennzoil. In the final film, we have the promoter Jurgens as the ring announcer. There's no mentions of him doing that in the script. But in the script, the announcer introduces four total fighters along with Joe Frazier. The first being the one and only Manasseh Mahler, Jack Dempsey. The crowd roars as Jack Dempsey waves and goes to Creed's corner, then Rocky's, wishing them good luck. Rocky is super excited. The timekeeper rings the bell and the announcer introduces former middleweight champion, the Bronx Bull, Jake LaMotta. LaMotta raises his fist and gives best wishes to both contenders. The timekeeper rings the bell. The announcer introduces the man with the big punch, everybody's favorite, the brown bomber, Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis bows and steps to Creed's corner. Apollo strikes a boxing pose and Lewis tosses a playful punch. Rocky says, They must be friends. Versus in the final film, he says that about Joe Frazier. I would have loved to see all three of the other fighters in the movie, but possibly it was due to a budget issue or a time issue. You never know with these type of things. As we close on the fight, there's still a split decision. Rocky smiles and looks at the wave of cheering fans. 
Mickey grabs Rocky's hand and raises it. The crowd goes crazy. Mickey tells him that he doesn't care what they say, he's a winner and of course, Rocky being Rocky, he asks for his locker back. <laughs> They grin and hug each other, then Mickey raises his hand again. Rocky and Apollo stare at each other that reflects admiration. Apollo climbs out of the ring and the fans crush forward screaming his name. Rocky also climbs out of the ring and waves. Mickey's eyes show mounting apprehension as the fans become abnormally active. The crowd gets rough with the police and Apollo's team, when suddenly Apollo is hoisted up in the air and carried by the fans. The same happens to Rocky and he's hoisted up by the fans. People chant Creed's name while others bellow Rocky's name. Polly tries to get to Rocky but is shoved aside and he starts swinging. Rocky and Apollo are completely at the mercy of the crowd. The chanting is deafening. Adrian runs headlong into the crowd. She angles through the mask to get to Rocky. After being manhandled and shoved throughout the crowd, she floats into Rocky's unbelievable battered but smiling face as he appears to be king of the world. Throughout the chaos, Rocky notices Adrian and both overcome physical obstacles with the crowd. Still suspended in the air, Rocky leans down and Adrian jumps up and they lock and embrace, with Adrian saying those three magical words to Rocky. This very last part of the screenplay kind of reminisces the ending of the final film, not including the whole spectacle of carrying the fighters in the crazy crowd, but the embracement of Rocky and Adrian. It would have been interesting to see. It may have been interesting to see the extended part in the spectacle with the crazy crowd and carrying both fighters around. During principal photography, they shot an ending featuring Rocky and Adrian walking out of the garden after the fight is over, but they decided the film needed to end in the ring at the peak of the moment of Rocky's life. So sometime later, they reshot the ending as it appeared in the film, and discarded the original ending. The film's famous poster of Rocky and Adrian holding hands is from the original ending that they shot, which is different than what happens in the screenplay, but they really nailed the ending for the final film. Stallone said he was inspired by the Webner Ali fight, and after watching it, he wrote Rocky in three days. He said that the first draft was 90 pages, and maybe 10% of the script remained in the final script. He has mentioned that the script was darker, Mickey was a racist, and Rocky throws the fight at the end. If there's any way I can get my hands on that draft, I would love to read it and do another episode about it. Yo Sly, if you're watching this, please send me a copy of that 90 page three day draft. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. Go ahead and click the like button and share it if you like it. And don't forget to subscribe. And let me know in the comments what other screenplays I should do. And don't forget to check out the Patreon page. A little bit goes a long way. More screenplay versus final film coming soon. Stay tuned.